This video is sponsored by NordPass. Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here, and there is a heap of topics to cover today, starting off with Starship development progress with the serial number five and six Starships, which are now stacked beside each other in the high bay. Then, of course, we've seen the SN7 test tank being tested to the point of rupture this week, not to mention huge work on the construction and launch sites themselves. We have another Starlink launch in the upcoming week, along with some interesting information on the newer rideshare program being offered by SpaceX. It looks like like Starlink will be kicking off private beta testing late this summer, so that is exciting, and Rocket Lab could be having its fastest turnaround of a mission yet with its next launch. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Since Elon's message to staff recently about making Starship the top priority, we certainly have been seeing loads of development activity, and it's not just isolated to Starship. The Boca Chica launch site has been undergoing a massive transformation of late. With the new launch mount and ram press installed, things look to be all set up for Starship serial number 5 or SN5 to take over from the exploded SN4. Drilling of footings has been going on over the last week or two, and there is a fair amount of speculation at this point, suggesting that this could be the beginnings of a super heavy launch mount. That would be amazing if true, but we'll need to wait and see what evidence comes to support that in the upcoming weeks and months. The SN5 was moved out of the high bay while the bottom bulkhead and skirt section of the SN6 was stacked with the rest of the main tank components. As we see here, they are now both stacked in the high bay together as we await the next steps in their prototype development, and it won't be long before we see another Starship on site. The SN7 test tank consisting of the 304L stainless steel was put through the rigors of pressure testing this week. It performed very well and reached 7.6 bar before a small rupture put an end to the test. Shortly after that rupture, it seemed like intentional venting took place there to accelerate that depressurization so that SpaceX could get back in and assess the damage. Shortly after on Twitter, Elon Musk stated that the tank didn't burst but leaked at that 7.6 bar. This is a good result and it also supports the idea of the 304L stainless steel being better than the 301. SpaceX are developing their own alloy to take this even further, but as Elon stated, leaking before a burst is highly desirable here. This is certainly true as we've seen with the previous ruptures that instantly caused an immediate burst of the prototypes. By SpaceX using a material that can stand up to this punishment better, that could be a game changer. Now the SN7 was intended to be a test to destruction. Elon has said that there are a few known weak points on the test tank and that it is probably capable of more pressure. The second test tank to follow shortly has addressed the weak points, so yes, we'll be keeping an eye out for that to begin appearing at the construction site. Now for those of you that may not have seen the previous prototypes, there have been a range of ruptures and explosions that have caused SpaceX to go back to the drawing board with various sections of the Starship design, issues with the weld quality, the thrust puck structure, and more recently the quick disconnect causing this dramatic explosion of the SN4 Starship. This explosion here was a monster, and it's almost hard to believe that the launch site has come away fairly unscathed and it's been restored back to this state so quickly. So at this point we think the SN5 will go on to do the 150 meter test flight, possibly a little higher. Both the SN5 and SN6 will probably take on a nose cone at some point and progress to some higher altitude flights. My guess is that these vessels are really just likely to head several kilometers in altitude and no further. I doubt we'll see either of these with aero surfaces that would allow testing of that skydiver maneuver that we've heard so much about. That will really require that 20 kilometer test flight. Could be wrong about that though, let me know what you think in the comments below. As always, a massive thank you to all those creators out there capturing all of the footage that we see at Boca Chica, but of course primarily Mary aka Boca Chica Gal working tirelessly to bring this content to us. Links to follow the amazing channels there are in the description. Now a shout out to Corey here who made a very awesome 3D animation using Blender to create this Starship flight using a single offset Raptor engine. Starship serial number 4 of course was going to attempt a flight with a single Raptor, but Sadly, it never made it quite that far. Elon replied to Corey here saying that a flight of this nature would indeed look a little odd. What the vessel would need to do is fly with an offset thrust to compensate for the center of mass not being lined up perfectly with the engine position. It would indeed need to fly at an angle like this to keep stable under flight. 
The SN5 of course should fly with three engines so we may never actually get to experience this in real life. So awesome work there, go and follow Corey's brand new Twitter account linked up in the top left there. I suspect there is a lot more to come. Now this week some eagle-eyed viewers spotted what looks to be a Boston Dynamics robot on Lab Padre's livestream here. Only footage from a large distance away, but we can make it out here. Just. This became even clearer when Cooper Heim snapped some images of this neat red dog kennel here with the name Zeus on it. Be sure to follow on Twitter there, lots of great shots have popped up from Cooper this week. So yes, I think it is clear that SpaceX are going to start utilizing some robot assistance at the launch site. If you need to remotely get footage to see what's going on during a test, what better way than with one of these puppies? These nimble robot dogs can climb stairs and cover rough terrain with amazing speed and accuracy. I'm certain the main purpose for Zeus here is to simply reduce the risk to the SpaceX team in what can be quite dangerous environments and of course to help document these processes with minimal risk as well. Also spotted was this SpaceX job posting for an offshore operations engineer, with details saying that the employee will work within a team of engineers and technicians to design and build an operational offshore rocket launch facility. Now this isn't a new posting, just something that has gotten quite a few people talking during the week. Elon Musk even chimed into this conversation here saying that SpaceX is building floating super heavy class spaceports for Mars, the Moon and hypersonic travel around Earth. Now, we've seen the Earth to Earth presentations before showing the benefits of an offshore spaceport. It's incredible to think that work is now in progress to turn this amazing future into reality. Of course, launches from sea aren't a new thing. China completed their first rocket launch from a floating sea platform a year ago. This mission saw the successful launch of seven satellites, and China aren't the first to do this. Most famously, Russia and Boeing's sea launch service was in action between 1999 and 2014, and it performed 32 launches during that time. The sea launch missions involved two main components per launch, the mobile launch platform Ocean Odyssey and the floating assembly ship Sea Launch Commander. These two craft were used to launch Zenit rockets which were designed as boosters for the Russian space program and they had good success records with only two failures. Interestingly enough though in 2006 Jim Mazer, the president and general manager of Sea Launch left the company to join an as yet unproven startup as their president and CEO. That startup of course being SpaceX. Now perhaps the success of Sea Launch has in some way helped SpaceX form their long-term vision? Let me know what you think in the comments. In any case, Sea Launch is aiming to start operations again in the next few years. Now, if you want to know more about the future Earth-to-Earth -Earth missions by SpaceX and what they could mean, I talk more in depth about that in this video. While you're here, of course, please do consider subscribing. There is loads more news coming with Crew Dragon and Starlink as well, and I'd love to share all that with you. Now, speaking of Starlink, it seems that the Federal Communications Commission is having some substantial doubts about whether low Earth orbit satellite constellations such as SpaceX or Starlink will have latency times low enough for requirements that would allow significant funding to be available for companies like SpaceX. The FCC has said that it has serious doubts that SpaceX and other low Earth orbit satellite providers will be able to deliver connections with a latency lower than 100 milliseconds. This is quite important as funding opportunities are available for ISPs to deliver connections of at least 25 megabits of download speed and 3 megabits of upload speed to poorly served areas. And look, we're not talking about small amounts of funding either. The Rural Digital Opportunity Fund will actually begin auctioning off funding in late October this year and will only be given to internet service providers that can meet the required criteria. Now, the FCC has said that it will prefer networks that have lower latencies, which is essentially a measurement of the time it takes for a request to travel from the sender to the receiver. This section here from the article certainly suggests that the FCC is unsure about the technology being appropriate for such funding, saying that applicants seeking to bid as a low latency provider using low earth orbit satellite networks will face a substantial challenge demonstrating to commission staff that their networks can deliver real world performance to consumers below that 100 millisecond low latency threshold. Now SpaceX of course have been very quick to argue this saying that the Starlink network will easily pass the 100 millisecond threshold needed to qualify for the funding. 
Elon Musk has in the past said that they are looking to have the network latency as low as 20 milliseconds or even lower, which will support intensive applications that really rely on very fast communication times. Now, provided that SpaceX can get the network running its beta tests well before October, there should be no issue with providing detailed test data of the network capabilities. As Ars Technica has pointed out here, if SpaceX and similar companies are rejected from the low latency category, they will be at a huge disadvantage in the reverse auction that will distribute $1.6 billion yearly over a 10-year period. That is certainly something that SpaceX is not going to want to miss out on. Now the 10th Starlink launch overall and the 9th set of version 1 batches is set to launch on Tuesday the 23rd of June, assuming that it hasn't been pushed back at this point. Now the Falcon 9 booster for this mission designated B1051 has already flown four times before, so this will be its fifth flight. It has previously launched both the Crew Dragon Demo-1 mission and the Radarsat mission from 2019, and two Starlink missions this year in 2020 in January and the 22nd of of April. That is only two months between its last launch and this one. If this booster lands on the drone ship successfully, that will be the second ever booster to be recovered five times. Interestingly as well, it now looks like private beta testing of the Starlink service is expected to begin later this summer in the United States, followed by public beta testing. You can now go and sign up for this on the website using your zip code. Now, if beta testing opportunities become available in your area, you may well get contacted there. I can't wait to see what people's real experience with this network is. So yes, this mission is going to deploy another batch of satellites, presumably either the 58 like we saw in the last mission or the regular 60. That is because this mission is going to include the second ever rideshare component on this Starlink flight with two satellites by Black Sky. Now, speaking of rideshare customers, SpaceX tweeted only a few days ago saying that more than 100 spacecraft have been signed up to fly on Falcon 9 since they introduced the rideshare program. Small satellite operators can book their ride to orbit online via the rideshare section of the site here. Now, initially, I wasn't sure how successful rideshare missions would be for SpaceX, but with them being mounted right on top of the Starlink satellites like this, SpaceX can get that extra funding to deliver these while continuing the rollout of its ground breaking network. The costs are super low too with SpaceX using the example of a $1 million price tag to send 200 kilograms into a sun synchronous orbit. SpaceX really have been the driving force in lowering the cost of mass to orbit and this is going to move to a whole new level once Starship flights become a reality. If other providers don't drastically follow, SpaceX are going to run away with the entire space launch industry. It's easy to see this already with the increasing frequency in Starlink launches. And the costs we are talking here are super low even when compared to Rocket Lab's dedicated launches. Of course, Rocket Lab has some other benefits due to the dedicated nature of their missions versus SpaceX needing to place many into similar orbits like with these Starlink rideshare missions. So yes, another incredible bit of news there adding the potential for future funding to help drive that ultimate goal of colonizing Mars. Now, if you've enjoyed what we've talked about here so far, consider taking a second to tap that like button that just helps tell YouTube that you value the content so that it's recommended more often and it helps me to then share more of these awesome developments with you. Now while we're on the subject of Rocket Lab, they of course launched their mission Don't Stop Me Now last weekend on June 13th from their launch site in New Zealand. I always love watching these launches and this mission of course went perfectly as well. But what was surprising to me was the almost immediate talk of Rocket Lab's next mission which is going to be called Pix or It Didn't Happen which is exactly in line with their mission naming style. I just love the character that they put into those mission names. So yes, this is going to be an interesting and potentially groundbreaking mission for Rocket Lab. We'll break this down more in a moment, but real quick, this video is kindly sponsored by NordPass. NordPass is the easiest way to secure all your accounts, credit card details, and private notes. Do you struggle with coming up with a new password or do you use the same password for all of your accounts? Well, before I used a password manager, I've got to admit I used the same password for a lot of different accounts and that is just super dangerous. If only one of those systems becomes compromised and that password is found out, you can be in real trouble. By using NordPass, you'll no longer have to burden your brain with remembering passwords or needing to write them down. 
Every new password you create will be completely unique because it will auto-generate secure and complex character combinations instantly for you. Once passwords are saved, you can simply use NordPass to autofill and log into your accounts with just a few clicks. NordPass can also make online shopping a breeze by remembering your credit card details, and it will also recognize many suspicious websites so you don't accidentally reveal your sensitive information. Thank you very much to NordPass for their support of my channel here, and if you would like to help support me and would like to give it a try, you can keep your password safe and organized by downloading NordPass for free at media.nordpass.com slash Marcus House. The link is in the description below. So yes, Rocket Lab's upcoming mission, Picks or It Didn't Happen, is scheduled to launch from Rocket Lab's Launch Complex 1, and it's currently planned no earlier than the 3rd of July. Now if that does happen, it will be the second launch in just under three weeks, and that will be the fastest turnaround of a mission for Rocket Lab to date. This is going to be a very cool one to watch as well, with the mission deploying seven satellites into a circularized orbit around the Earth at 500 kilometers in altitude. There will be a range of customers on this mission including Canon Electronics, In Space Missions, as well as Planet who just sent up two satellites on SpaceX's last Starlink launch. So yes, we have Canon's CE Sat-1B which will be the primary payload for this mission and that neat little satellite will be doing some interesting demonstrations of Earth imaging technology using wide angle cameras with very high resolutions. Next we have the Faraday CubeSat by In Space Missions and then finally Planet will have five Super Dove satellites heading up to add to their constellation of Earth observation satellites. I believe this is the world's largest constellation of this kind and the capabilities of networks like these are I think probably lost on many people. As stated on the site, Planet's mission is to image the entire Earth every day and as these constellations grow there is no limit to what could be achieved here. The incredible data set helps governments and researchers and businesses to quickly see patterns and detect changes very rapidly which also helps to make better decisions. These latest SuperDove satellites have higher image quality as well, so they are evolving all of the time. If you haven't checked out planet.com, you really should go and take a look at the incredible imagery of the Earth here. Let me know in your comments what your favorite shot is. There is so much to choose from here. Just take this amazing shot of SpaceX's Crew Dragon preparing to launch Bob and Doug to the International Space Station. It really is an incredible time to be alive to see the advancement in all of this technology. Now just quickly, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons here. You are all quite literally turning this dream of mine of creating this content from a hobby into something much bigger. If you like what I do and would like to join our awesome patrons here, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. You can interact with me more directly via the included roles in Discord. You can check out some more exclusive patron-only content. And you can also have your name listed right here like these other amazing people. Thank you sincerely to all of you. And a massive thank you as well, of course, to my amazing amazing quality control squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be part of this, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video the other week talking about Starlink and the awesome fairing footage here. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.